All right, so for those of you who are not familiar with the soybean aphid, I brought some along if you want to pass those around. And the goal today for me is to give you kind of a feel for what soybean aphid is, how it fits into soybean production, and then foliar insecticides, how they fit into soybean aphid management in, in a larger kind of context. So first off, soybean production in Minnesota. We are a very large producer of soybean. Uh, these are, data are a little bit dated, but over 7 million acres, and we're producing, you know, getting about 50 bushels per acre in soybean. So soybean is a, it's a hugely important crop in Minnesota. Uh, this crop, from the time it's planted, when the growers put the seed in the ground until it's harvested, it is threatened by different pests. So the seed can be attacked by things like seed corn maggot, wire worms, as the plants begin to grow, the early vegetative stages can be attacked by bean leaf beetles that feed on the leaves, uh, potato leaf hoppers, which are piercing sucking, kind of sap sucking insects. And then in that picture on the far right is a, a leaf infested with soybean aphids. And they make their living by, by sap sucking. They pierce the plants, kind of like a mosquito, pierces our skin, and, and it sucks the juices out. Then you get into the later growth stages of the soybean plants. And some of the same pests, you get bean, bean leaf beetles, grasshoppers, various different caterpillars, and then the soybean aphids are still an issue. And among all these pests in the north central region, especially in Minnesota, the soybean aphid is the most significant uh, arthropod pest. So the soybean aphid, if you look at that picture of just one little aphid, you know, they, they kind of look kind of cute and cuddly, not very menacing. But when they gang up in hundreds and thousands per plant, that's, that's when you encounter problems. And this insect was first detected in Wisconsin in 2000 and rapidly spread throughout the soybean producing region. In that map, uh, the counties highlighted in red are all the counties from which this insect was detected in 2000. And then the yellow counties go back to by 2009 where it had spread to. So again, throughout much of the soybean producing uh, area of the north central US and then into uh, southern Canada as well. This insect, it meets the definition of a true invasive species. It's, it's originally from Asia, so parts of China, Korea, Japan. So it's not from the US, it came here, and it is causing problems. Um, this insect has a pretty complicated life cycle. Us entomologists like to come up with complicated terms, so we call it heterocyclic and holocyclic. And basically what that means is it spends part of the year on one plant, the other part of the year on another plant, and it does have sexual reproduction sometime within the year. So what we have here is the scenario in the spring when the soybean aphids are on buckthorn. Um, so they'll hatch from eggs, they'll go through a few generations, and then a winged form will be produced. And then that winged form, is a microphone cutting out on you guys? Okay. Then that winged form migrates to soybean, and we usually see them showing up in late, uh, kind of mid to late June. And then in summer, they'll go through maybe 13 to 15 uh, asexual generations on soybean plants. As plants get overcrowded or plant quality decreases, um, these aphids can produce winged offspring that can redistribute uh, within fields or to other fields. And um, again, you get this asexual reproduction. There's no need for mating. They're all females. The only time we have males is later in the season, and I'll show that. So these are reproducing machines. They've got telescopic, telescoping generations, so the offspring are born pregnant. And then in the fall, as the soybeans are beginning to senesce, the aphids migrate back to buckthorn. You get males and females produced. That's when you get the sexual reproduction. And the females will lay eggs under the, uh, the buds of buckthorn. And it's those, those eggs that will overwinter, hatch in the spring, and complete this cycle. So what's the impact of this pest in agriculture? Um, you can see huge infestations on that upper leaf, uninfested plants on the lower leaves there. Uh, the feeding, like I said before, they're, they're removing the sap from the plants, so they're removing the nutrients that the plants are producing. There's evidence that they're affecting photosynthesis of the plants, and it can cause you know, yield losses as high as 40% if, if infestations are left unchecked um, you know, by affecting the number of pods per plant, the number of seeds per plant, the size of those soybean seeds. Um, also, the, can alter the, the protein and oil uh, composition of the soybean seeds. And in addition to that, soybean aphid, like a lot of other aphids, is pretty good at vectoring diseases. So they can pick up viruses from some plants, transmit them to others. 
and they have been documented doing that in soybean. Uh, fortunately, the, these viral diseases of, of soybean that the soybean aphid transmits aren't huge issues um, in northern soybean production. And um, they have also been documented facilitating soybean cyst nematode, which is an important pest of soybean as well. And now kind of the, the topic of the day is insecticides for soybean aphid management. This is an important tool for uh, protecting soybean yields from this pest. Uh, what we're focusing on are potential non-target impacts of this. And you know, so what I'm going to transition into now is kind of the role of insecticides in soybean aphid management. So I like to think about that as, as integrated pest management, or IPM. And this graph here is kind of a, a cartoon that I like to use to uh, depict this, where we've got time across the x-axis, uh, crop damage or even pest abundance on the y-axis. This uh, flat line across the middle represents um, a level of crop damage or a level of pest pressure that would cause economic losses or economic damage. And the squiggly line is kind of how the, the pest population would be fluctuating through time. So before you would apply any kind of management tactic, you know, it's pretty likely that those pest populations would be above damaging levels. And then hopefully we can come up with some kinds of management tactics. In this case, we call them preventative management tactics. So they're not in response to some huge infestation. We're applying those and hoping that they'll suppress that pest population to a lower equilibrium level. Unfortunately, most of these tactics are not silver bullets. So we will occasionally get outbreaks. And that's where the, uh, currently where the chemical insecticides, foliar applications of insecticides come into play to knock those populations, those outbreaks back down before they reach economically damaging levels. So to divide up some of the, the management tactics that are being used right now, let's focus on the, the preventative tactics. And if we think about crop production in general, there's a pretty huge list of different preventative management tactics that can be used. Uh, pest resistant plants, biological control, crop rotation, um, you know, changing planting dates or row widths. But for soybean aphid, the only ones that have really been shown effective are resistant plants, the use of seed treatments, and biological control. So just to go through some of these preventative tactics, uh, host plant resistance. So these are soybean plants that are resistant to the pest. In this case, it's, it's not genetic modification. They're not transgenic plants. And it's a heritable resistance, so passed on from one generation to the next. And we've got some some uh, entomological terms that define how these plants affect the pest. So they can affect the biology of the pest, maybe it's survival or reproduction. They can affect the preferences of the pest, so maybe they'll choose soybean variety Y instead of soybean, var soybean variety X. And then there's tolerance, which is basically just a stronger soybean plant, where it's not affecting the soybean aphid directly, it's just that that plant can tolerate higher aphid pressure without experiencing a yield reduction. So for soybean, we do have aphid resistant soybean and there's been a lot of work done over the last you know, 10 years or so uh, to identify resistance genes. So that's what we have here, this, this, these RAG genes, resistance aphis glycines. Aphis glycines is the scientific name of the soybean aphid. And you know, some of this work you know, going back to say 2004 was being published and we've been continuing some of that in my laboratory now in, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Aaron Lorenz. But the data here on the y-axis, we've got cumulative aphid days. So that's a measure of aphid pressure over time. So if you're familiar with growing degree days, it's kind of how the aphid numbers accumulate over time, kind of looking at area under the curve. On the x-axis, we've got different soybean lines. We have a susceptible soybean line. And then we've got two different soybean lines, each with a single resistance gene. One has the RAG1 gene, the other has the RAG2. And over on the far end, we've got a situation where we have pyramided resistance, where we've got a, a single soybean line with two different resistance genes in it. And what we can see, you know, from multiple years, multiple states, we had, we had good aphid pressure exceeding the, uh, the economic injury level, which is a point at which economic loss is expected to occur in these soybean plants. So on the susceptibles, we had, we had pretty huge aphid pressure. With the single gene resistance situation, we see that we had effective suppression of the soybean aphid, but again, it's not a silver bullet. 
we did have populations uh, reaching outbreak levels or, or exceeding that economic injury level. But then if we look at that pyramided situation, we saw very effective suppression of the soybean aphid and protection of yields. So unfortunately, you know, the, these resistant plants have been available since, say, 2010, but the availability for northern soybean production, particularly Minnesota, is very limited. Um, one of my graduate students and a postdoc, Shidi, who's in the, the room right here, put together this list of soybean lines that are available. So of the hundreds or maybe thousands of lines, I'm not sure how many there are, Aaron, but there's a ton of soybean lines that growers can choose from. Among all those, there's about a dozen lines that are available, adapted to Minnesota, that have aphid resistance. So in addition to that, you know, so some of the, the challenges that growers are facing, there, there's not much out there for resistant lines. And then the, the aphids can outsmart us. We've already found soybean aphids that have been able to overcome some of these resistant genes. So you can have a soybean plant with one of these rag genes, but certain populations of aphids can survive and reproduce on those lines. So we've got a biotype one, which is susceptible. It hasn't overcome the resistant genes. Then we've got biotype two and three that can overcome the single gene situations of resistance. And then the kind of the scariest situation is biotype four, where we've got populations of soybean aphids that can overcome the pyramided resistance, where you've got rag one and rag two. Can I interrupt and just yep. ask a question about the kind of resistance? When you, when you talk about resistance, does that mean the, the plant maintains its yield even under the same pressure, or does it mean that the plant is no longer attractive? Right, so I mentioned those three types of resistance early on. In this case, it's not that tolerant, so it's not the case where you get huge numbers of aphids and the plants still yield well. This is the case, especially you know, for reg one and reg two, where it's mainly these plants are affecting the biology of the aphids, so their survival and their ability to reproduce. So those plants could get colonized with the same number of aphids as a susceptible plant, but the populations just do not grow as well. So because of that limited availability, and then we've got these virulent biotypes, you know, there's a real need right there to try to get more sources of resistance, so more of those reg genes, and to start developing more and more of these multi-gene pyramids. And just kind of highlight some of the current research that we have going on. And again, it's focused on increasing the availability and adoption of host plant resistance for soybean aphid management. This kind of tactic, is, it, it's a cornerstone of integrated pest management in a lot of other systems. But like I said, it hasn't been very widely adopted in soybean production yet. So we're hoping to get things there. Because if we can increase the adoption of this, it should be able to decrease the frequency of outbreaks and the magnitude of those outbreaks, and by doing so, decrease the amount of insecticide that needs to be applied. So this is a collaborative effort between my lab and uh, Dr. Aaron Lorenz's lab. And just to show some of the work that we've done, uh, one of the students in my lab, uh, Anthony Hansen, got a hold of a bunch of different soybean lines from Asia that have not been evaluated before and he screened those for susceptibility to aphids. So each bar is a different soybean line. Across the bottom is the mean number of aphids uh, per plant after 14 days of infesting those. And if we zoom in, we can see kind of the bottom section of the graph here. These red bars are soybean lines that we knew had resistance. They had the single gene resistance or, or the pyramided situation. And the ones with asterisks are ones that sh previously unevaluated soybean lines that showed resistance to the soybean aphids. So we documented four additional soybean lines with resistance, and now some of that collaborative work that we're doing right now is to try to figure out what kind of resistance this is. Is it one of the known resistance genes, or do we have something new here? And then working with the breeding program, trying to incorporate these resistance genes and other resistance genes into well-adapted soybean for Minnesota. Shifting gears here, another uh, preventative management tactic could be the use of seed treatments. So these are coatings on the soybean seed. It's often a neonicotinoid insecticide. It's taken up by the plants and it's expressed within the plants and can very effectively protect um, plants for a fairly limited period of time after emergence. However, what this cartoon shows you, if you look at the, as a soybean plant develops over time, this red triangle represents the concentration of that insecticide that neonicotinoid insecticide that was taken up and is expressed within those plants, over time that decreases. 
And this bell-shaped curve represents kind of the abundance of soybean aphids. And the challenge here in using the seed treatments for soybean aphid management is you don't always get good overlap between the effective concentrations of the insecticide in the plants and the colonization of the, of the, uh, of the soybean. Biological control, just want to point out that there are a bunch of different natural enemies. And uh, Dr. Heimpel will talk about that after me. So now if we look at some of the therapeutics. So again, what I talked about before are tactics that we're trying to develop to knock down that kind of equilibrium population level of the pest. So what happens when, you know, when those pest populations outbreak? We've got threshold-based applications of insecticides, you know, other things like early harvest or inundative biological control. But for soybean aphid, the only thing we're really looking at is those foliar applications of insecticides. So the way that that typically works in, in the north central US is the grower or consultant is out counting soybean aphids or estimating densities of soybean aphids on those soybean plants. You can see that these fields can be huge. And then they re relate that estimated density, number of aphids per plant, to a threshold. So in this case for soybean aphid, it's 250 aphids per plant. This graph just briefly has time on the x-axis, pest population. Over time, that pest population grows. Hopefully that grower is out there scouting their field over time. When it reaches 250, that trigger point, the economic threshold, they should apply that foliar insecticide to knock that pest population down so it doesn't grow to those economically damaging levels. So once they hit that threshold, that's when they line up that foliar insecticide application to, to knock those populations down. Um, the foliar insecticides that we have available for soybean aphid management, we have a lot of different uh, products that growers can buy, but those come from less than 20 different active ingredients, so actual chemicals, and all of those only come from three different insecticide groups or modes of action. So you got things like the, um, the organophosphates, the pyrethroids, and then the neonicotinoids. So these are all broad spectrum insecticides. Um, I'm not going to go into details there, I think I'm running short on time, but just to show that these insecticides are very effective at suppressing pest populations, aphid populations. Uh, just a quick overview. Um, the foliar insecticides, again, they're broad spectrum, meaning they're good at killing lots and lots of different kinds of insects. These applications can either be applied by ground, so you saw a sprayer connected to the back of a tractor, it could be that kind of application, or it could be an aerial application where it's flown on with a helicopter or an airplane. Generally, one well-timed application of an effective insecticide will be sufficient to protect yield. And when I say well-timed, again, that's relating to that threshold. So scouting those fields regularly, when you hit the threshold, apply the insecticide to knock those populations down. Um, to give you some feel for the percentage of soybean acres that are being treated, I did a survey in 2013 and in 2014 of agricultural professionals. So these are crop consultants, industry folks, and asked them you know, of the acres they're managing, what percentage had to be treated for soybean aphid in the prior year. Average across those two years is about 37%. So, you know, it's not, probably not the most robust estimate, but it was the best estimate I had uh, of the percentage of acres that needed to be treated. And that's something we really need to look at. Um, you know, I think in, in my lab is doing a, a more thorough survey to get a feel for, for how widely um, these tactics are being implemented. Just real briefly here, another highlight of some of our research is trying to go from this situation where you're tromping through you know, chest high soybean in the middle of the summer, which really, really sucks, and trying to count tiny little aphids. If you look at those aphids on those, on those leaves that I passed around, and trying to get into the use of remote sensing. Can we fly over these soybean fields and use hyperspectral or multispectral sensors to detect soybean plants that are being stressed by this pest? And some of the work that we've done so far, we've been able to document that as aphid pressure, cumulative aphid days increases, we get a decrease in one of the common vegetative indices, NDVI. So we've got work going on now in trying to get some funding to continue work to look at, you know, actually, so this previous data was collected from the ground. You know, so can we still detect these signals from an aerial platform like a UAV? Can we distinguish this stress from other stressors like disease or drought? And again, it's a team effort. We're working with folks from aerospace engineering, uh, plant pathology, applied economics. 
So in conclusion, soybean aphid is the most significant arthropod pest of soybean. Foliar insecticides are, and I'd say for the foreseeable future, will continue to be an important tool for suppression of this pest. Uh, the current research you know, at the University of Minnesota and other states in the region is focusing on trying to find ways to decrease the amount of insecticide inputs for management of this pest. And in regards to these non-target impacts, you know, I think we really need a valid risk assessment to be performed to, to get a feel for, for what's really going on. So with that, thank you. If there's time, we'll take questions. Otherwise, you can kick me off the stage. Are there any limitations of, in application of these foliar insecticides? Uh, any weather variables that are restrict or constrain the application conditions? Yeah, so, so with the foliar applications of insecticides, are there any weather conditions that... Wind, particularly. Yeah, so if, if it's... You do not want to be applying these insecticides or other pesticides when it's windy because you're not going to get as effective. You're not going to get as effective control, and there's a higher risk of drift. So that pesticide is less likely to stay in the field and move on to other surrounding habitats. A lot of the pesticide labels have recommendations, you know, for not applying under certain wind conditions. Is that a, is it any kind of legal requirement, or is that just advisory? Well, so it, you know, things like this that are on the label of a pesticide, the label is a law. So there are, you know, there's some. There's some teeth behind that, you know, where the, the Department of Agriculture can, can enforce things along those lines. Because I've, I've had to leave areas where I was working because of wind conditions blowing spray from a neighboring field, and I wondered mm -hmm. if, if they're supposed to be doing that or not. Well, they're probably not supposed to be, but, you know, it, it, it can happen, right? And there's tons of acres being sprayed, and, you know, I think most folks are doing things the right way, but for one reason or another, you know, some folks might not. You know, and who knows why that is, you know, with all the other pressures that these farmers are dealing with, you know, maybe they, that's the only chance they had to get that application on. Yep. Sort of related to that. Do you know what proportion of the insecticide application for aphids is done below the 250 threshold? Is it large? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, so we, we've got these recommendations for use of that 250 aphid per plant threshold. We know well that some folks are not using that threshold and making more kind of these insurance applications. And that could be, you know, maybe when they have 10 aphids per plant, there's marketing pressure from, from certain companies to apply these insecticides at, at earlier levels. Um, you know, there, a lot of these insecticides are fairly cheap right now, so it's the, that input cost is relatively small compared to a higher commodity value. So if the farmer's going through the field already with, a, say, a herbicide application, you know, there's a, some folks might add in an insecticide and, you know, we, we strongly recommend against those prophylactic applications because there are negative consequences that can come from that. If you're applying that insecticide too early, you'll do a good job killing off those few aphids that are there. But keep in mind that those few aphids that are there aren't causing economic damage yet. You know, that 250 isn't even where they're causing damage. You need, you know, 675 aphids per plant on average to cause economic damage. So you're killing off aphids that, that aren't and might not cause economic damage. You're also killing off the natural enemies. These are often broad spectrum insecticides. So you're killing off the good guys that George will talk about and that can leave that field kind of wide open where when aphids come in, they can have a free for all. And in addition to that, the more and more we're applying these pesticides, we're increasing the selection pressure for these pests to develop resistance. And over the last couple of years, we've been getting some indications of, of failures of some of these pyrethroid insecticides for soybean aphid management. And we've actually documented some, um, some resistance in some populations. But I do not know the percentage. You know, we, we do do surveys at pesticide applicator training, and we're trying to develop some questions to try to get at that. Yeah. So stay tuned. Have one more. <laughs> OK, uh, the question. I'm, I'm interested in the spread for, you know, how these things leave fields and such. Are there any data that indicates the level of pesticides in native prairies or off field? Yeah, so I, I don't have that. Yeah. Then I'll ask one more question. Bob, if you could go back a couple of slides. Your little logo you have in the corner. Back one more. Yeah, that. What, this is time, but in the soybean aphid where 
the preventative fails and the therapeutics are applied, how does that overlay with some of the actual time scale of, say, skipper population? For clear. skipper populations, I know yeah, so basically as much this. as you guys know from the previous two presentations. So, I, so oftentimes these foliar applications are being made in you know, mid to late July into August. You know, I guess usually later July into August. Yep. So, this is okay, so I'm not sure when, how that matches up with the phenology. I, I don't recall exactly from the previous two. Yeah. Okay, thank you.